The Case in the Missing Manuscript. Hello, I'm Jay Nichol of Nickel Investigations, and this is an Ontario Cold Cases, Canada's true crime podcast. Fictional episode of Who Done It Wednesdays. Go back to the golden era of detective fiction and enjoy stories in the tradition of the greats of writing. From Agatha Christie to Raymond Chandler to John Creasy. These are short stories I hope you enjoy. Part 1. The Disappearance It was most unlikely place for a mystery to, to begin. At a dinner party in the quiet London residence of Mr. James Laverley, a modest writer of modest successes. Laverley had gathered a small group of friends, each a colourful character in their own right. There was his publisher, the gregarious Mr. Frederick Hayes, sharp-witted critic Miss Lydia Farnsworth, the suspiciously quiet secretary, Miss Emma Baines, and the overly genial amateur detective, Roger Quinton, whose insatiable love for puzzles would soon become crucial. It was over the second course of Pheasant when Laverley announced quite suddenly he had just completed the finest work of his career, a mystery novel of unprecedented complexity and ingenuity. However, it was only when he rose to retrieve the manuscript from his study that the evening took a darker turn. Moments later, Laverley returned, his face ashen. My manuscript, he said, voice trembling. It's gone. There was a hush around the table. For a few moments, the guests regarded one another in stunned silence. Then, as though snapping back to life, Roger Quinton leaned forward with a glint of interest in his eyes. Lock room, he murmured to himself. Spanish manuscript. We must get to the bottom of this. Part 2. The Locked Study The study was a small cluttered room filled with the trappings of a writer's life. Piles of papers, books stacked precariously, and a large oak desk upon which the missing manuscript should have been resting. Curiously, the window was shut and bolted from the inside. The only door to the room led directly to the hallway where the guests had been sitting. There's no way someone could have entered this room and taken this manuscript without a scene, declared Hayes, scratching his chin in confusion. Quentin, ever the optimist in the face of a challenge, examined the lock and the window latch with great care. Indeed, it would seem impossible, he said thoughtfully. And yet we know the manuscript is gone, which means it must have been taken. The question is how and why. Miss Farnsworth, ever critical, spoke up. Publicity stunt, perhaps? Way to make your little book more interesting, she asked, eyeing Laverley with suspicion. But Laverley shook his head vigorously. No, I tell you, it was here only an hour ago. Someone has stolen it. Quinton stood up, his eyes narrowing. We'll solve this. First, we must establish who had the opportunity to enter this room unnoticed. One of you must be the thief. Part 3. Suspects Roger Quint was nothing if not methodical. His first course of action was to interview each guest in turn. First was Mr. Hayes, whose cheerful demeanor did not quite mask his financial concerns. As Laverley's publisher, Hayes had much to gain from the success of the missing novel, and yet he denied having touched the manuscript. Next was, was Miss Farnsworth, the critic. Her sharp tongue and sharper mind were matched only by her disdain for Laverley's work. She was quick to dismiss the notion that she could have stolen the manuscript, but her motive seemed plausible. Perhaps she wished to suppress Laverley's success 
out of professional jealousy. Then came Miss Baines, the secretary, who had been curiously quiet throughout the evening. Shy woman, she seemed startled by the accusations being flung around. But her proximity to Laverley gave her easy access to the manuscript. Finally, Quentin interviewed Laverley himself. He appeared genuinely distressed by the loss of his work. As Quentin observed, the pressure of writing a masterpiece could drive a man to do strange things. Could Laverley have staged the theft to generate intrigue? Each suspect, both opportunity and motive, yet none seemed likely. Quentin pondered this as he mulled over a glass of sherry. The mystery deepened. Part 4. The Clue It was late that night when Quentin discovered the key to the case. As the guests retired to the rooms, he lingered in the study, his eyes scanning the shelves and desk for any overlooked detail. And then quite by accident, his hand brushed against a loose panel beneath the desk drawer. Quentin pried the panel open to reveal a hidden compartment. Inside was a small envelope. On opening it, he found not the missing manuscript, but a letter addressed to Laverley. It was a blackmail note. The note demanded a sum of money in exchange for the safe return of certain sensitive materials. Seeing Laverley had a secret, one so damaging that someone was willing to extort him for it. Armed with this clue, Quentin realized the theft of the manuscript was not a simple act of opportunism. More play. Perhaps Laverley secret was buried in the pages of the missing novel. But who had written the note? And why? Part 5. The Unmasking Next morning, Quentin assembled the guests in the drawing room. He had pieced together the truth. Now it was time for the grand unmasking. Ladies and gentlemen, Quentin began. After the manuscript was not merely an attempt to sabotage Mr. Laverley's career. It was an act of desperation. Worn out of fear and greed. The missing manuscript contains details. Then Lee veiled his fiction. It exposed a very real crime. The room fell silent. Quentin continued. Miss Baines, you're the one who took the manuscript. You fear that Laverley's novel will reveal your involvement in embezzling money from him over the past year. The blackmail note was sent by you in an attempt to silence him. Miss Baines gasped, her face draining of color. No, I, she stammered, but it was too late. Quentin had deduced the truth. It was clever, really, Quentin said. He knew that Laverley was preoccupied with his novel. He wouldn't notice the small sums missing from his accounts. But when he saw that his story was drawn too closely to reality, he panicked. The manuscript had to be stolen and fast. His pains crumbled under the weight of Quentin's accusation, confessing to everything. The manuscript was soon recovered, hidden in the garden shed where she had hastily concealed it the previous evening. As the mystery came to its dramatic conclusion, Quentin allowed himself a satisfied smile. Another case solved, and with it, another triumph for his insatiable love of puzzles. Laverly, relieved yet shaken, thanked Quentin profusely. His novel, though briefly lost, was now destined to be a success, and with its real-life scandal attached, it would surely sell more copies than he had ever dreamed. But Roger Quentin, ever modest, Really tipped his hat and murmured, All in a day's work, my dear fellow. All in a day's work. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed these videos and podcasts, please consider subscribing to Ontario Cold Cases and his true crime podcast, available wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Don't forget to tune in daily for new episodes.